Indeed, brothers and sisters, we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we count it a privilege to be able to assemble around the table of God's Word one more time. If you would, help me to share the title of our sermon encounter this morning. I want you to repeat after me, Lord, Lord I, don't I don't want to be stuck. One more time, Lord, Lord I, don't want to be stuck. I don't want to be stuck. So gracious God, we pray that you would continue to hear our hearts cry. Cry out to you, the true and living God. The God who is the object, the subject of our praise, but also of our plea for help. You, O oh God, are our all in all. So we yet look to you, knowing that when we look to you, we can live. Therefore, bless this time around the table of your word. Bless your word unto our hearts as you glorify your name. Amen. May be seated.
although he was seemingly a 30 year old man, he yet behaved like a child. He was an adult looking man, but he was still stuck in childhood. You may be wondering why it is that I begin our time of encounter in this way. It is because I believe that the very same reality that befell Josh Baskin, an adolescent who now is found in an adult body, or in reverse, one who is presumably an adult man, stuck in childhood. It's really, in a sense, the reality that the Pauline writer seeks to address. This is the reality that he seeks to address as he saw it necessary to write to the church at Corinth. For those of you who have been following our time of worship and sharing, you would realize that we have spent some time in reading and also proclamation Looking at what Paul has to say, thus far we have covered chapter 1, we have covered chapter 2. But Paul is found addressing a community of people, believers in Christ, who yet find themselves in that Greco-Roman territory of Corinth, a place where wisdom and rhetoric and philosophy Describes as it did they also in Rome. You find here a people that have encountered God in Jesus the Christ. The people that therefore Paul shares with, speaking about this new life. A new life with God in Christ comes by way of faith declared in God's good news concerning Christ. A people that at some point would have made their yes to God in Christ. He shares with them the kind of life that is possible. A life that is led by the Spirit. A God who therefore renews us. And causes us to be a new kind of creation. A new kind of human beings. And while we are not taken out of the world. It is, in a sense, those who become a community and therefore ought to reflect the sense of Christ, the sense of Christ-like thinking and Christ-like acting as the Spirit moves upon the people of God. It is to this people that Paul finds it necessary to write because he recognizes that they are still. In fact, as he shares with them, he says it in this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, as we have heard read. So brothers and sisters, he says to them, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food. For you were not ready for solid food. Even now, he says, you are still not ready. For you are still of the flesh. You can hear the imagery that the Apostle Paul uses with regards to the church at Corinth. A church that by grace he founded as led by God. He speaks to them with the reality that he wanted, wanted to be able to feed them with solid food. He understands that when one comes to God in Christ, it is as if we are born again. And he understands that when you're dealing with newborn babies, you have to feed them with food that they can manage but food sufficient to nourish them. But the expectation is as they continue to grow, you will need to be able to feed them with solid food because the milk would not be adequate for their growing bodies. There will be the need for solid food. 
says to them, I recognize in your early uh, beginnings that you were not ready for solid food, so I, I fed you with milk. But he says, even now, you are still not ready. This becomes a matter of concern for Paul because he realizes that they are now in a peculiar position. They are no longer based on time. Persons that have just come to God in Christ, they are no longer a people that have just come to point in faith. They have made their yes to the Lord for some time now. And by this time, they should be in a different place. But he says, I was coming to feed you with solid food, but I had to because I realize you still ain't ready. This becomes a concern for him, not just because it reflects a sense of something awry. That is, when anyone comes to God in Christ, they are a new creation, but it does not stop there with a yes to the Lord. As time goes on, this people should begin to mature. And by maturing, he is therefore able to teach the more weightier things. It's like with your children, you have to break down certain concepts and give them the basics, things that they can handle. But you know that there is more that they have to learn, but you have to give it to them as they can manage. And he is saying to them, you are still operating at an infantile state. How could this be? A church filled with persons who knew the Lord and were gifted. A church where many boasted of their spiritual giftings. This is a church, ironically, where many persons there were able to suggest that they had a superior knowledge in God. Interestingly, this is a church that saw itself or filled with members that saw itself as being spiritually mature, therefore spiritually elite. And he says to them that while you see yourself in that way, the truth of the matter is you are still infantile. He says after all this time, you're still not ready. Someone look up and say, Lord, I don't want to be stuck. Before we begin to feel as if we are imposing names and name calling on the church at Corinth in route to name calling others of us here today. Here is how the Apostle Paul knew that they were not ready. He says it in verse 3. For you are still of the flesh. And when he says that, I don't want to bore you with the Greek, but really he is speaking of the fact that rather than being a people who are led by the Spirit, a people that are open to the Spirit of God, that they are people who go having said yes to the Lord, they are still being governed by their own human desires and instincts. He says, you are still operating as a people being governed by the flesh. And how does he know? He says to them, for as long as there is jealousy, and as long as there is quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh? As long as there is jealousy, and as long as there is quarreling among you, are you not behaving according to human inclinations? For one says, 
big time position. And watch this. Even with your spiritual gifting, you and I can still be spiritually inward. Someone touch yourself and say, oh Lord, I don't want to be sick. This becomes the concern that I have. I don't want to be one who has the appearance of an adult. When persons look to me to offer and to operate as an adult in the realm of the spirit and in terms of Christian life and Christian ministry, I don't want to be stuck with a childish mentality. Because I cannot do the weightier things of ministry while I'm still behaving in a childish way. Therefore, he offers a remedy for those of you who are like me. To say the truth of the matter is, I know that I love the Lord. I know that he died for my sins in Christ. I know that I have been brought into fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I know that God has given me gifts and graces in Christ. But I also know that on the inside, I still have some petty proclivities. I still have some growing up to do. And Lord, I don't want to be stuck at my point of immaturity. I don't want to be stuck in my disillusionment. Instead, oh God, I want to be all that you have called me to be. Is anyone else like me this morning? All right, I just want to make sure, because if I was the only one who had that issue or concern, then I would have to keep my prayer, the prayer that I want to offer this morning, I would have to keep it at a personal level. But because I'm not the only one, because I'm not the only one, I can say the prayer, including you, my brother, including you, my sister, I don't have to say it in the first person singular. I can say my prayer now in the first person plural because I realize that there are others of us who don't want to be stuck. We don't want to be stuck in immaturity. We don't want to be stuck in our disillusionment. We don't want to be stuck in our preoccupation with self. We don't want to be stuck. So here is the prayer. It's not so much a sermon but a prayer. Lord, help not just me. I'm praying, Lord, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. We don't want to be stuck. We don't want to be stuck in immaturity. Lord, help us. And help us to do what? Lord, help us to see you as the true source. That's the first point of my prayer for us. Lord, help us to see you as the true source. When you hear Paul addressing a people that he has gained information concerning, the household of Chloe, according to chapter 1, kind of filled them in on the divisions and the reason for it. So he understood there was a clashing from the various factions, cliques if you please. Those who boasted saying they are of Paul came in by way of Paul. Others I came in by way of Paul. Others I came in by way of Cephas. He understood that. He asked the question, who is Paul? He asks the question in verse 5 of chapter 3, who is Apollos? And he suggests that there are only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has said. In other words, he says to them, you are putting Apollos on a pedestal, and you are putting me on a pedestal, and you are arguing back and forth concerning who is of a better group. But he says in the scheme of things that Paul is nothing without God. And Apollos is nothing without God. And all that Apollos would have done has only been done because of God. And all that I, Paul, have been able to do, I have only been able to do it
our challenge is be still on the level of personalities. And therefore we have a church life in the Bahamas where if we're not careful, we can have people who are praising and holding up their pastor or holding up their minister or holding up their reverend or holding up their bishop or
What's that? 